this week on Quadriga, Israel, Gaza, the hour of the extremists. Israel's military operation in the Gaza Strip has surely weakened Hamas's ability to fight. But it has also cost the lives of many ordinary Palestinians. The UN has warned that indiscriminate attacks may amount to war crimes. Israeli soldiers and civilians have also been killed, driving a further wedge between the two sides. As international mediation efforts continue, Israelis and Palestinians seem further apart than ever. Fertile ground for extremists on both sides, whose answer to the problems of the Middle East is simply to reject the other side. Your host this week, Ali Aslan. Hello and welcome to a new edition of Quadriga. While one is inclined, sadly and unfortunately, one is inclined to say, here we go again. 20 years, more than 20 years after the Oslo Agreement, Israelis and Palestinians seem to be further apart than ever. Why is this conflict seemingly so unavoidable and unsolvable? That is what I want to talk about on today's show together with these three experts. Welcome to Daniel Dagan, who is an Israeli journalist reporting as a Berlin correspondent for the Israeli Broadcasting Authority, the country's leading public TV and radio station. Silke Tempel is the editor-in-chief of Internationale Politik, the leading publication of the German Council on Foreign Relations. She also has a long experience reporting on the Middle East. And Anna Younes is a German-Palestinian PhD student at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. Her academic work focuses on race and racism, in particular on anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim racism. Welcome to you all on today's show. Daniel Dagan, this latest outbreak of conflict started seemingly with the kidnapping and killing of three Israeli teenagers in the West Bank and the repercussions, if you will, the revenge killing of a Palestinian teenager. My question to you is, is, was this latest outbreak of conflict really unavoidable? Did perhaps the Israelis use the pretext, use the kidnapping and killing of the three Israeli teenagers as a pretext for the strikes? You say it's seemingly. It's in fact seemingly because uh, those rockets have been fired into Israel since 14 years. 14 years. I had been many times to Sderot. This is a town, a small town, near the border of Gaza. Uh, most people who live there come are refugees or the sons and daughters of refugees who come from Arab countries. Something widely not very well known in Germany and Europe, but this is the case. And they have been suffering all along. And every two months or three months or two years or whatever, it comes again. It's, it's not stopping. And now it's an outbreak which is unbearable and it can't be tolerated by Israel. It's, it, it's, it is hitting also other areas, not just Sderot. But in my, in my view, Sderot is as important as Tel Aviv or Haifa or for that matter, any other center in Israel. And it's time to stop it. So, Anna Yunus, it's time to stop it, says Daniel Dagan, saying Israel had no choice but to react. What's your take? Well, my take is, is that not only in Germany, but also the international community, and particularly, obviously, Israel, is forgetting the fact that this uh, colonization of Palestinian land has been happening since 48, if not even earlier, if you want to be more precise. So what is actually happening in Gaza right now is that this small strip of land with more than one and a half, one dot eight million people, in fact, living there in a hermeneutically sealed off strip is actually defending their right to self-determination. And as a couple of Israeli journalists, as well as international reports, as well as the UN has actually said so far, this is an attempt to break the siege that Israel imposed for more than six years by now, seven years in total since 2000, 2006. So this is something that is being forgotten. As for what uh, Mr. Dagan said right now, as for Arab Jews uh, uh, basically being living on the border of Gaza, which is true, which is actually going back to the establishment of Israel, 
putting Mizrahis always on the border and the conflict zone with Palestinians. Mizrahis historically have also been the first Arabs, Jews, or Jews in general, who have actually not uh, conscripted or have rejected to join the army. And only in the recent 30 years that has changed due to neoliberal racist attempts of your country to actually break uh, uh, any kind of solidarity between Arabs, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Thank you. Zeki let's look at this latest outbreak. Uh, we have the sad figures uh, delivered by the United Nations, close to 700 Palestinians dead, uh, approximately 75, 80 percent so civilians. Um, aside from, we can argue whether these strikes were justified or not, but are they also proportionate? Well, there's always the question about proportionality in these conflicts, of course. I mean, this is a very difficult situation. Is there's all, in all asymmetric warfare, this is a difficult situation. I mean, the point is um, that Hamas has made a deliberate strategic decision, and the decision was um, to arm uh, and to import um, weapons instead of any other goods that would serve the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. And um, we, should, we should take Hamas seriously as a serious actor in, in this whole, uh, whole <laughs> theater of war, as it's, it's called. Um, making the deliberate decision to, to really start a rain of rockets into Israel was a deliberate one because Hamas is, is in a very precarious situation. They've been in power since 2006, actually after roosting everything that looked like Fatah including throwing them from, from um, skyscrapers in, in Gaza. Um, and they have not delivered to their people. Um, there is a siege on the Palestinian people in Gaza, no doubt about it. And this, this siege is not only very problematic, it is a humanitarian disaster, both from the Israeli and the Egyptian side, but also Hamas, and we have to take this into consideration, made a clear strategic decision, which was we do build tunnels. Uh, we do use the money we did get um, from Qatar and also from Turkey um, to build these tunnels. They're very elaborately built. Um, they must have cost a fortune, um, which means we made the decision to arm instead to build what we, what we have there to build. And that has to be taken into consideration. Now, to respond to this um, and to a rain of rockets, and we've seen far more wide-ranging rockets this time, is very, very difficult. And we see time and again, we see it for the third time that of course there's an outcry about the humanitarian disaster that's happening to the Palestinian civilian population in Gaza. But it is also very difficult for a state whose first obligation is also to protect its citizens um, to stop this. And this is what any kind of mediation has to take into consideration. This has to be not only a military approach, we do need a political approach that takes the humanitarian, the social, the economic situation of the people in Gaza into consideration. But Daniel Zagan, isn't this latest outbreak of conflict not in fact strengthening Hamas? Because as you know, Zika Temple obviously said, they were in a somewhat precarious situation uh, due to the Arab Spring and the Syrian conflict. They've sort of lost Syria as an ally. They've lost Iran as an ally. The regime change in Egypt certainly was not in their favor. Uh, you could argue they were having a difficult time to regroup and now this latest outbreak of, uh, outbreak of conflict sort of plays into their hands, doesn't it? Uh, you, you've talked about the siege, which is a very important, uh, important issue, but uh, let's consider the facts. Uh, I've been many times to the crossings between Gaza and Israel Every day you can see 500, 600 trucks bringing food, humanitarian assistance and everything else. Not, not these days, these days it's just 10 or 20 trucks because of the, because of the war which is taking place. But uh, normally they get food from Israel, from the Israeli border, from the Israeli side. They get uh, medicine, they get uh, cement also which they used in order to build those tunnels. This is the one thing. On the Egyptian side, you have also a crossing. Sometimes it's open, sometimes it's not. But one thing is sure, and we have the evidence. The rockets are the evidence. Arm um, are coming to Gaza. It has been the situation for many years under Mubarak, Maybe not to a very large extent, but it has been the situation. 
And it has been certainly, it was certainly the situation under Morsi from the Muslim Brotherhood. He made sure that Hamas rearms and has this arsenal of weapons which can hit Tel Aviv and Sderot, of course, and Haifa and many other uh, cities and towns and villages in Israel. So siege is very, very relative. Let's take it into proportion. Now, one of the reasons, in my opinion, why Hamas started this particular uh, round of conflict is that, in fact, the new ruler of Egypt, my country, by the way, I come from Cairo. I know very good the neighborhood where Sisi grew up. I grew up in a neighborhood not far from there. Uh, Sisi is, has decided not to let those arms come to Gaza. And this is a very important point. Hamas is protesting. It's getting uh, support from Qatar and Turkey. And it, it doesn't accept the fact that the arms are not be being delivered anymore. Well, let's give Anna to Yunus a chance to respond. You've heard the argument being made over and over again, not on the show. Israel is merely defending itself. It is Hamas that is provoking by launching rockets into Israel. I didn't say that they're provoking. I said they made a strategic decision. That's a bit different. But the, the argument is being made in, in the discourse of this conflict, perhaps not by you personally, but this is... The, the, the standard response on the part of Israelis usually to say, we are, being, we are being attacked, we have no choice. What is your take? Well, obviously the rhetoric uh, that is going on for um, decades, maybe even since, you know, 48 again, I'm referring to the colonization of Palestinian land, which is actually the root cause of it, um, has actually been to put the blame on Palestinians for uh, uh, the non-stopping of the conflict. So it actually turns around a settler colonial conflict to make those being colonized responsible for not submitting themselves. And that actually recently has been published by Gideon Levy in Haaretz as well. Amira Haas has said that. David Theo Goldberg, a professor um, at UCLA in, in California, has made exactly the same argument. That has been the argument of Fatah in the 60s and 70s. This is ongoing. Whether that is Hamas right now that is arming itself, the PFLP or Fatah, it doesn't matter. It is always the Palestinians that are wrong and at fault for Israel not having peace and for Palestinians to not backing down. And that is the rhetoric that you both are employing right now. So you can tell, there's certainly been no, talk, uh, no, no lack of attempts for peace talks here. Uh, we, no. 20 years, uh, more than 20 years ago, also agreement, Madrid agreement, Camp David, Anna My Horst. agreement, you name it. You name it, yes. you name it. Why is, uh, we've looked at countries like Rwanda, where in a time span of two months, 800,000 people killed each other, and yet the country sort of has been able to reconcile with each other. Germany and France, been to two world wars, fought two world wars together, now are leading uh, allies in the European Union. Why is this conflict seemingly so unsolvable? How many hours do we have? Well, <laughs> so? um, unfortunately, only 28 minutes remaining. Well, even in that short of time, it's, it's very difficult to pinpoint. I mean, certainly um, there were huge mistakes made uh, by both sides, of course. Um, I think there were many opportunities missed. Um, in many, many regards. It is as if um, whenever there was an attempt to, to get down to negotiations, first of all, we do have what we call, what we call de de destructing uh, actors in this. Um, and, and we do have um, sort of a, a missing of opportunities. I mean, certainly uh, the one thing that the Israelis never understood uh, was how, how much distrust there is by building the settlements. I think that is the one single most stupid uh, an arrogant thing that the, that the Israelis ever could do. The one thing that the Palestinians always missed, from my perspective, is with the exception of Salam Fayyad, uh, for whom I do have real great admiration, is that for having a state, you have to build a state. You have to have the institutions. What you can't have is, as Arafat did after Oslo, 11 different security services uh, who were really enormously corrupt and Palestinians rightfully complained about this. I've been to Gaza many times and of course the West Bank 
And it was awful to see um, how, how corrupt it was and how they were basically also blackmailing a lot of Palestinians and, and taking resources away from them. This is not how you build a state and how you build institutions. There is, of course, a lack of trust between the two sides for different narratives. There is a lack of, of confronting um, the extremists um, for whom it is all too easy to disrupt uh, peace negotiations. There's no trust um, uh, between uh, um, Mahmoud Abbas and Netanyahu these days, for good reasons, uh, I believe. Um, that makes it also difficult, and it's not comparable with Germany and France after the Second World War. I mean, after the Second World War, it was clear one side had to lose, and that was Germany, and they had to lose big and visible for everyone. And that was exactly the case. We, na we, we faced a near-death uh, experience after 1945. We had a new conflict and a new ideological conflict arising, and we had an allied Western powers who helped us democratize. All that is absent in the Middle East. And there are many all more of that factors. Is, all of that is absent, says, uh, and that's why I want to ask you to, there's, no, there's no trust here, says Zilke Temple, and also no empathy, if you will, uh, perhaps understanding for the other points. Daniel Dagan, do you understand, and I want to ask the same question to Anna Yunus, do you understand the Palestinian position? Do you understand their concerns? I do, I certainly understand. Uh, just a, a remark, you said, uh, you mentioned the settlements. There's not a single settlement in Gaza. Israel vacated all the settlements. It ended its military presence. It ended its civilian presence nearly 10 years ago. So this cannot be the reason for Gaza to attack Israel, for the Palestinians in Gaza, for Hamas to attack Israel. We have tectonic changes in the region. We have Islamic, the rise of Islamic movements. We had it in Egypt and Muslim Brotherhood. Hamas is part of the Muslim Brotherhood and it changed, now it, it, it there is a change in Egypt. Egypt doesn't accept anymore. But, but let me get back yeah, to my yeah, original but, yeah. question about empathy, uh, yeah, aside well, from I, the I consolation. Yes, I do understand their concerns, but I tell them it's time to see their realities. What is the reality? The reality, the reality is that about one million Jewish refugees who were persecuted for generations in Arab countries came to Israel to their homeland and settled down there. And about 600 Palestinians, Arabs, they didn't call themselves Palestinian back then, but in 1948, they left the region, the, where the state of Israel was created. There was a terrible conflict. There was a war launched by Arab countries and by the Arabs who lived there, who, by the way, worked together, Al Husseini, with with the Germans, with the Nazis during the Second World War. And, but let's forget about it. It happened. Refugees from two sides. The Israeli refugees, the, the, the Arab refugees, the Israelis who came from other Arab countries settled down. I myself was in a re refugee camp, camp. I spent a few years in a refugee camp. And then we, know, we, we started a new life. We created institutions. We, we did everything in order to build a viable state. And the Arabs didn't do that. And part of the blame, a big part of the blame, in my view, is with the UN. UN created UNRWA, a, an agency dedicated solely, solely for Arab refugees, which has practice the assignment of perpetuating this status of refugee. Anna this Yunus. is the core. Anna Yunus, yes, this is you. the core. I think this is, I mean, this is really uh, the rhetoric of actually using um, less than a million Arab Jews uh, to, counter, uh, to counter the argument of less than a million Palestinian refugees in 48 is more than cynical, Mr. Dagan, really more than cynical. We have learned from Arab Jewish historians and academics that uh, Jews 
of European lands have always fled since 1492 to Arab lands and to Turkey to seek refuge from European Christian anti-Semitism. And they've always sought that. So what you're talking about, even in Egypt, until the, in, even into the 50s, there was a, a Jewish a minister for economic affairs. What you're talking about in terms of being persecuted for generations is a mere lie and a construction of your state. It is not true. You are trying to underline the actual Palestinian argument for the right of return and the expulsion of Palestinians in 48 and further on, in fact, which is happening until now in Gaza and in the West Bank, in Lebanon and everywhere else. So as for the arguments um, that we've heard before, I mean, from what is coming from your side, it really, I mean, it really, this, these arguments only work if the underlying assumption is, if you're already equating that with uh, Germany and France, that there are two countries. I wasn't, I wasn't no, but that, I you, was you were basically already is... the illusion to refer to, you know, uh, the, the First and Second World War, let's say, you know. I mean, even the illusion to that needs the underlying assumption that Palestinians actually have an army or a country with a viable uh, uh, institution. And so I, I'm going I all along. I, I, I want I to finish asked, my argument. I, was I want to finish my argument. Comparable. So basically, what I'm trying to say is that it's not that, you know, the PA is not corrupt. I'm completely going going there with you, you know. Nobody trusts Abbas anymore, which is actually the reason why in 2006, Palestinians democratically elected Hamas, whether the West or Israel likes that doesn't matter because Palestinians also don't like the Likud. Nobody asks that. We also don't like uh, a Republican American uh, Congress. All right, we don't like that. Acceptable. Is anybody asking it? Do we actually, do, do Palestinians or Arabs, do they, uh, I don't know, conquer Paris? No, they don't. I mean, what is the argument here really? This is an asymmetrical war. So actually putting the blame on Palestinians to not be able to, to build a viable state. Well, let's go back to the actual uh, Camp David Accords. Camp David actually meant that 20% of Palestinian land was left over. Right now, Palestinians are living in Bantustans. This is a term used from South Africa uh, an actual incarceration of, of, of black South Africans vis-a-vis -vis a white supremacist uh, ideology, all right? So this is actually what is happening right now. Even if we're watching German public TV and there's a little, you know, like those, those geographical uh, uh, boundaries of the West Bank, that does not exist anymore. This is a lie. This is a fabrication. It does not exist. Gaza was actually starting, or the Israelis started building a fence around Gaza in 94. In 94, this is when this government started to build a, a fence around Gaza. This has been planned. This is nothing that just happened two weeks ago, three weeks ago, or nothing. As for the recent events after the, the, the kidnapping and killing of the three youths, 2,100 in just two weeks, 2,100 Palestinian homes in the West Bank have been raided raided. 700 people have been put in indefinite detention. More than 1,000 people inside of the West Bank and Israel of Palestinian origin are now in prison. I want to hear something about that. Where is actually, where is legitimacy for that? This is, in any case of international law, this is forbidden. This is just forbidden. Uh, let, let me just uh, send you to the history books. Uh, the uh, yellow star came from Arabia from the region where Saudi Arabia is heute, today situated. This is for one thing. So I, I just send you to the <laughs> history books well, to, the history to books learn. No, no, I know, the, I know, no, I know. Let, I want let me to, just, let me I ask want you to, this. I want let me to ask you this, the because the history situation. books are important. But let's no, look forward. No, but she's saying something wrong. I mean, there were pogroms, there were prosecution in Arab countries. That's a fact. Post but it was also it has to do it, it, it has to do okay. with the establishment of, of Israel. Ago, it, it has to do with okay. Zionist organizations that actually okay. planted okay. bombs no, in Iraq. That, that, that is not what was created a thousand years ago. Thousand years ago. Let's, 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 let's look forward to it, please, because the issues, the yeah. issues are still the same Absolutely. ever since we started. Absolutely. Status right. of Jerusalem, borders, settlements, refugees. Status of Jerusalem, refugees. We've been talking about them Prisoners, for, of course. for decades. The, uh, absolutely. How to move forward? Water resources. How to move forward? Well, the first thing, of course, the immediate thing is, and I'm, I, well, I mean, just to remark on that, you've asked me why it is so difficult um, to make peace. I mean, <laughs> this is the example, because I don't think that by giving speeches uh, with, with uh, Berkeley, Berkeley type speeches, we get we don't get any forward. The first Im immediate task is um, to stop the bloodshed that's going on right now with Gaza um, and to mediate a ceasefire. Uh, there's 
no way that we can get into bigger steps right now. This is not realistic, it seems to me. So who will be the mediators? Egypt has been trying. I'm not sure that Qatar is a good mediator. Qatar has been far too involved in building Hamas. Um, it's not trusted by the Israelis. Egypt is, but it's not trusted by Hamas. Um, can, the, can the US put pressure on it? I'm not so very sure. What I find interesting is that for the first time, and we see now the third round of this solely Gaza conflict. We don't see it in the West Bank right now, and I do agree, I think, um, the raiding of homes and the arresting of so and so many, many, uh, many hundreds of Palestinians is illegal and they should be freed immediately. If, it should at least be part of a ceasefire agreement. Now, <coughs> what, what I think has to be done, there's a really interesting um, um, paper on, on the table right now, which was designed uh, by Shaul Mufaz, uh, who's politically not very strong, leader of a very small party, Kadima, who had lost a lot of seats in the last parliamentary elections. Uh, who was um, the Joint Chief of Staff of the Army. But the approaches, and it's interesting that it's coming from the Israelis, is finally the insight that if we cannot solve, solve this in any way, militarily anyway, but we have to have a political, social, economic approach. There has to be a fund to rebuilding. There has to be a fund that makes sure that the rebuilding is not used as Hamas did time and again um, to, to build tunnels into Israeli territories but concrete infrastructure. Hamas has not been building any hospitals, any schools, any whatsoever, but they've been building 60 tunnels. This cannot go on. This does not serve the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. So only a ceasefire where Hamas at, at one point or the other can politically say we've achieved something which is cynical enough because they also brought the destruction upon Gaza themselves. That takes into consideration that there has to be rebuilding, where there is a fund um, that would make sure that this is th the funds are really used for rebuilding, where there is a certain disarmament um, in that sense would, uh, would make sense in my view. And this is the first thing. From then, from there, we might take it and make another attempt. And yes, of course, there has to be pressure on the Israelis um, to come forward. Of course, there has to be pressure on the stop on, on, on settlement, etc. But the first immediate thing is to try to get a ceasefire negotiated. Well, as we've yes. seen, as we've seen on this show as well, emotions run very high when we talk about this particular conflict. And it's no different. It's a conflict that is not only confined to the region. Let's have a quick look. A street battle about Gaza. Yet it's not happening in the Middle East, but in a suburb of Paris. French police moved in when pro-Palestinian protesters defied a ban on demonstrating. Amid the unrest, a Jewish shop was reportedly set on fire and anti-Semitic slogans were shouted. Not for the first time, criticism of Israel is being used as a cover for anti-Jewish hatred. Uh, I think that people here understand that when you try to burn a synagogue, when you attack a police uh, station, where you call this anti-Semitic uh, uh, slogans, it is the values of the Republic that are put in uh, question. In Germany too, there have been many pro-Palestinian demonstrations. In some cases, anti-Jewish slogans have been shouted, prompting sharp condemnation from the German government. Well, Anna Yunus, we've just seen the pictures of the protests taking place all across the world, but particularly mm -hmm. in Europe. Yeah. I want to focus on Germany, because obviously Germany, due to its historic uh, ties uh, to the state of Israel, mm -hmm. has a special role here. Um, the protests we've seen, the protests we've seen taking place in German cities, sometimes the, the, the line between criticism of the state of Israel and uh, blatant anti-Semitism was crossed. Uh, what's your take? Um, first of all, actually, since, since there are two people having a, a different opinion from mine, I'd like to respond to, um, to what you've said before. Um, actually, Hamas came out with a ceasefire proposal uh, mid of July that has completely been, um, you know, let's say neglected or not even picked up upon by Western politicians and, and the media, which actually demanded exactly what you just said, um, uh, the lifting of the siege, an internationally, um, uh, uh, an internationally supervised air and seaport by the UN, 
uh, UN controlled borders. So actually Hamas is asking for the UN to control the borders to Gaza. Um, uh, the uh, increasing of the fishing zone to 10 kilometers. Um, the Let's really put 12 on the table right now. Just oh, that's, for your information. that's very nice that it's two more. That's very yeah. sweet. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there are much more. It's actually 10 demands that I'm, uh, uh, the rest I'm actually uh, missing right now from the top of my head. As for your question, um, well, as for for what we've just seen in France, um, from what I've heard from you know a comrade in Paris, um, from the Jewish community, whatever, a, a rabbi apparently came out and said that the attack on the synagogue didn't happen. I'm not there. I wasn't there. I'm not. Uh, you know, I'm not a. I'm not. But let's talk about the protests so, that did take place. Yeah. Uh, let's not yeah, get involved thank you. in the. Thank you. In, I mean, you showed the footage. In, so in the details, you know. um, is some people equate criticism uh, directed towards the state of Israel mm -hmm. as anti anti semitism? Uh, yeah. There's a there's a fine line to be crossed. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, historically speaking, what actually anti-Semitism means is that there is a certain, at least for an European lens, which is where it comes from, or Christian European lens, is that it's actually a fantasy or an investment into a fantasy and through the figure of the Jew, where, you know, you make this, you know, phant phantasmatic uh, uh, figure uh, responsible for everything, even if you only have five Jews in the country or you don't even know a Jew. But, you know, as Sartre actually said, you know, even if there were no Jews, you know, Europeans would have still invented anti-Semitism. And I think this is exactly when of the uh, prime uh, uh, pillars of what anti-Semitism, maybe even racism in general, um, means. So actually having, so basically you don't have a conflict and you still gas six million people, right? This is what anti-Semitism means. Um, in the Middle East, you actually have a conflict. And what Zionism managed to do is to actually equate Jewishness with the state of Israel. But it always wants, Israel always wants, and the, the, uh, the supporters of the state of Israel always want its opponents and critics to make that very clear line and distinction between Jewishness and Zionism, whereas even the Israeli state doesn't do it. Even though even the, the, the Jewish Defense League in France, for instance, they also don't do it. So it's really, I mean, it's a, it's a slippery trope. You know, I'm not saying that anti-Semitic slogans didn't happen, but we really have to look at the facts. And as Rolf Alega just recently said, you know, it's the actual moment that was made by the Israeli state to conflate these two things, you know, Jewishness and the Israeli state. This is really, uh, this is a fundamental problem. Daniel Zagan. Unfortunately, you live in denial. You deny the fact that Jews were persecuted in Arab countries for many years, for hundreds of years. You deny that the yellow star com comes from Arab lands. I've never said you deny I'm denying that, so, that Jews Sorry, were sorry, I didn't I'm interrupt sorry. you. I didn't interrupt you. I, please let me speak. Uh, you deny the fact that the area of Jordan is also a part of the mandate of Palestine. So the country is much bigger than you presented it here. And the Arabs control 80% of Palestine, actually, and not just 20%, as you said, or as you uh, imagined. So we have here, we have to get the facts straight. Uh, those protests, I heard them. I live in Berlin, and I heard them. And in the Wilhelm Street, which is a major street in Berlin, I heard, I don't want to repeat the slogans that I heard. Uh, I think what what is really a source of concern for, for Germans, for Europeans, for myself too. It should be for you too, but you are not, uh, you don't uh, seem to be concerned, is the fact that the, those extremists, those activists, they were mainly Arabs, I think, or Muslims, radical Muslims. I think they feel that the society, the German society, is tolerating this. This is the problem. Günter Grass spoke a few months ago about the Jews, and he said that Israel is the most dangerous country in the world, something like that. This enhances anti-Semitism. This enhances such protests. This gives them legitimacy. And this is the problem, and this should be a source of concern for Germany, which it is. If I may add, there, is of course, uh, there are, of course, enormous emotions involved, um, which, are, which are fired up by the conflict. 
Um, I, I do not think that any one of those guys who were protesting the streets is left untouched by what they see on TV. And what they're watching is, is mainly Arab TV who, who are a bit less, um, how would I say, um, sensitive about showing the most cruel pictures because they think this is important to do to show what's really going on. Now, what we see is anti-Semitism in the, Europe's, the European sense is racism really was not a concept of the Muslim world, in, uh, but it seeped in um, through the Nazis also um, um, and, and later on. And what we see now, and it's really visible in many of the Arab media, if, if, you, if you follow this, and, and, and in huge parts of societies is <laughs> a very strange phenomenon. First of all, the Zionists, which are also called the Jews, you know, they don't make any distinctions here very often, are made responsible for about every evil that's happening and every problem that's happening in the Middle East. Now, I'm not saying that Israel is not causing problems. The occupation is unacceptable, no doubt about it. But the Syrian conflict, the conflict in Iraq, um, many of the sectarian conflicts in Lebanon don't have anything to do whatsoever uh, with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I mean, look at the civil war. So now, what, what, what has happened over the last decades, and that should worry us all, um, is a general explanation uh, that it's the occupation as designers to be blamed. And yes, there is a paper thin line between, uh, between uh, emotions and rage and anger and everything about the occupation and, and, and the racism that is directed against the Jews. And it's no coincidence uh, that, the rallies, that the rallies in Paris and the demonstrations ended up in a synagogue and that, um, of course, I mean, we've seen the, f the footage, um, there, there was an attempt to storm the synagogue. I've been there at the demonstrations in, in Berlin um, and, and it was amazing the kind of anger uh, that came out. And uh, really, uh, I also do not want to repeat the slogans because they are unacceptable and I do not think that we should accept them. I think it's absolutely, uh, it's absolutely legitimate to express the anger, uh, but not with slogans like that that are clearly racist. And what drives me up the walls is we haven't seen any of this anger expressed over the Iraq war, over the Syria war where there are 200,000 people killed. Uh, we hadn't seen this years ago in the Algerian uh, civil war where there were 200,000 people killed um, in, this, in this awful civil war. We only see this when Israel is involved or when the Americans are involved. We never see this when it's just, when it's sort of an inner Arab um, affair. We've never seen this, you know, pro-Kurdish pro demonstrations and, and Kurds were, were um, persecuted awfully in Turkey until Erdogan finally started peace talks in other places. So there is, an, uh, there is a huge element of bigotry and, 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 and uh, um, um, double standards in this. Anna Yunus. I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's really hard to even <coughs> counter argue because there are so many things being intertwined that have actually nothing to do with each other. So uh, first of all, um, I, I completely distance myself from uh, from what you actually have said, that I don't, uh, you know, take any persecution of uh, Jewish people um, seriously um, or anything like that. That is nonsense. Um, I think anti-Semitism is a real problem, especially in Europe. Um, but what is happening right now, especially since 2000, is that uh, more and more policy reports, uh, academic as well as NGO work inside of Germany and, in fact, inside of uh, Western Europe, generally is uh, uh, pushed into work with. So so-called Muslims, um, which apparently now, as we can see, the discourse evolving also materially through funding from the uh, from state institutions, that actually Muslims are the new. Um, um, transmitters, this is how they're called in, in those documents as well, of anti-Semitism. And I think what I'm hearing from you now is actually feeding into that stereotype. We're not talking about the anti-Semitism of factual, Europe. If you of, look at we're it. not it's talking not very about stereotypical. We're not, you know, there have been, you know, there were two demonstrations. We're not talking, let me finish first. We're not talking about the um, actual anti-Semitism that has not been tackled in this country um, post the Holocaust or even before whatever. I mean, the, it's not even been a debate to my mind. It's just been a, a a nodding off of Zionist Israeli propaganda, that's it. But actually, anti Semitism was not really fully um, tackled in this country. Um, so as for the demonstrations, I was at the demonstration that was just filmed or edited into uh, this short little video clip. That was a demonstration of uh, children and women against the, uh, the war. There was no anti-Semitic slogan being said other than, which was called anti-Semitic, other than actually uh, uh, um, Israel kills children, Israel Kindermörder. Um, uh, 
So the recent UN and report. What about you? Do you the, 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 the fight is the, fine? The, the, can, I, can I please, and, yeah, can I please uh, finish this? Can I pig? please finish this? Of course. So, What was actually done with the footage when it was transmitted on TV is that people edited footage from other demonstrations. There were two where anti-Semitic slogans in Berlin were actually being dropped. And we don't know these people. Some of them came from the left, from the right wing I was, spectrum. I was there. I've and heard they, these can slogans. I, can I please finish? I mean, really, we are fighting a media war here even. Like people, the media came, they, they spoke only to like little children, basically, 15, 16. 60 year old children, the only questions that these people were asked was about Salafism, anti Semitism, and Islamism. And that was it, you know. And the footage eventually, I mean, to actually tell us that that saying Israel is killing children is anti Semitic, the recent UN report that came out said that over the past 48 hours, a child every hour has been killed through the bombardment. Every hour. Israel bombards the UN, it bombards four, four hospitals, everything. I mean, this is, I mean, we cannot, no, no, let me finish. There's one thing here right now, actually. There's a huge anti-Muslim racism luring inside of Europe, okay? And those demonstrations that we're facing right now, and we have huge problems actually understanding who's going to demonstrate, what is being well, chanted, as difficult and as we it are is, moving. I'm sorry, Anna Yunus, as difficult as it is to end this on a hopeful note, we only have a minute left. Just one, one sentence for each, despite everything that's been said, Daniel Dagan, are you hopeful? Despite I am everything very, I am that's very hopeful. Said, are you I'm hopeful having, that this I'm, will be resolved in our lifetime? I am, I am very hopeful because I think this situation in Gaza where Uh, Hamas is using the population as human shield will end when Egypt intervenes. And I do, do see the hope and the vision that Egypt will take control and manage this situation. As difficult as it is, you know, with all the sloganizing to be helpful, I do see people on both sides who put a lot of creative thinking and energy into coming up with new attempts and new attempts and new attempts to solve this. So. Anna Yunus, one sentence. I think everybody except the, you know, the Western world is on our side, so I'm quite hopeful too, maybe not in the short run, but in the long run. Well, despite everything that's been said on today's show, at least we've ended on a hopeful note, and perhaps we can take solace and hope from a new website that's called Jews and Arabs Refuse to Hate Each Other. That would be a start to get things started. I want to thank my guests for a very spirited discussion. I want to thank you out there for tuning in, of course. We will continue to follow the story as it unfolds. Thank you out there for tuning in and looking forward to seeing you again next week for a new edition of Quadriga.